Namo Buddhaya. Good evening. Welcome to the Buddha Dharma TV. I'm Dr. Han Lim from Melbourne, Australia. Today, we begin our programs with the chantings of Dharma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, which was the first sermon that the Buddha delivered to his first five disciples at the Deer Park in Varanasi, India. Let's now listen to these noble sermons. It would be nice if you try to understand the meanings of this discourse. Here is the Dhamma Chaka Sutra. In the original Pali language, now residing by the venerable monks in Thailand. Ewame Sutang Ekang Samayang Bhakawa Ah, 
ิภาวตันหาอิทังโคปนาภิกขเวตุกะนิโรโทอริยสัจจังโยตัสสะเยวตันหายะเสสวิราคะนิโรโทจากโคปตินิสะโคโมติอานาลโยอิทังโคปนาภิกขเวตุกะนิโรทัคามินีปฏิปทาอริยสัจจังอายเมวะอริโยอาทังกิโกมะโคสัยยาทิทังสัมมาทิฏิสัมมาสังกัปปุสัมมาวาจาสัมมากรรมันโตสัมมาอาชีวะสัมมาวายโมสัมมาสติสัมมาสัมมาอิทังทุกขังอริยสัจจันติเมภิขเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิเวชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิตังโคปนิทังทุกขังอริยสัจจังปริญญาญันติเมภิขเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิตังโคปนิทังทุกขังอริยสัจจังปริญญาตัณติเมภิกขเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิอิทังทุกขสมุทโยอริยสัจจันติเมภิกขเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิตังโคปนิทังทุกขสมุทโยอริยสัจจังปะหะตาพันติเมภิกเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิตังโคปนิทังทุกขสมุทโยอริยสัจจังปะหินันติเมภิกเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิอิทังทุกขนิโรทัวอริยสัจจันติเมภิกขเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิตังโคปนิทังทุกขนิโรทัวอริยสัจจังสัจิกาตาพันติเมภิกขเวปุเพอนโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุตปาทิยานังอุตปาทิปัญญาอุตปาทิวิชาอุตปาทิอาโลโกอุตปาทิตังโคปนิทังทุกขนิโรโตอริยสัจจังสัจจิกตันติเมภิกขเวปุเพ
านโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุทัปาติยานังอุทัปาติปัญญาอุทัปาติวิชาอุทัปาติอาโลโกอุทัปาติอิทังโตขนิโรธคามินีปฏิปทาอาริยสัจจันติเมพิขเวปุเปอานโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุทัปาติยานังอุทัปาติปัญญาอุทัปาติวิชาอุทัปาติอาโลโกอุทัปาติตังโภปนิทังตุขนิโรธคามินีปฏิปทาอาริยสัจจังภาเวตาพันติเมพิขเวปุเปอานโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุทัปาติยานังอุทัปาติปัญญาอุทัปาติวิชาอุทัปาติอาโลโกอุทัปาติตังโคปนิทังโทคานิโรธคามินีปฏิปทาอาริยสัจจังภาวิตันติเมพิขเวปุเปอานโนสุเตสุธรรมเมสุจักขุมอุทัปาติยานังอุทัปาติปัญญาอุทัปาติวิชาอุทัปาติอาโลโกอุทัปาติยาวะกีวันจะเมพิขเวอิเมสุจตุสุอริยสัจเจสุเอวันติปริวัตตังทวัตสาการังยถาปุตังยานาทาสนังนสุวิสุทังอาโหสิเนวตาวาหังปิกเวสเทวเกโลเกสมาระเกสพรหมเกสะสมณพรหมนิยาปัจายสเทวมโนสายาอนุตรังสัมมาสัมโพธิงอภิสัมโพโตปัจจัญญาสิงยโตจะโคเมพิกเวอิเมสุจัตุสุอริยสัจเจสุเอวันติปริวัตตังทวัตสาการังยกาปุตังยานาทาสนังสุวิสุตังอาโหสิอาทาหังพิกเวสเทวเกโลเกสัมมาลเกสัพรหมเกสัสมณพรหมนิยาปัชายสเทวมโนสายาอนุตรังสัมมาสัมโพธิงอภิสัมโพโตปัจจัญญาสิงญาณันจัปนเมตาสนังอุตปาทิอโกปาเมวิมุติอายมันติมาชาตินาติธานิปุณาภะโวติอิธรรมโวจะปะคะวาอาตมนาปัญจวาคิยาภิคุปะคะวโตปาสิตังอภินันตุงอิมาสมิงจะปะนวัยยาการณาสมิงพันยมาเนอายาสมโตโกนทัญญาสวิรชังวิตมะลังธรรมจากคุมอุทปาติยังกินจิสมุทยาธรรมังสาพันตังนิโรธธรรมันติปวัติเตจะพคะวตาธรรมจากเกภุมมาเทวาสาธรรมโนสาเวสุงเอตามพระคะวตาภาลานาสิยังอิสิปัตเนมิคทายเยอนุตรังธรรมจากกังปวัติตังอาปฏิวัติยังสมเนนวาพรหมเนนวาเทเวนวามาเรนวาพระมุนาวาเกนจิวาโลกาสมิติภูมินังเอวานังสัตถังสุตวะจัตุมหาราชิกาเทวะสัตตมโนสาเวสุงจัตุมหาราชิกา
านังเทวานังสัทธังสุตตวาตาวัติงสาเทวาสัตธรรมนุสาเวสุงตาวัติงสานังเทวานังสัทธังสุตตวายามาเทวาสัตธรรมนุสาเวสุงยามานังเทวานังสัตตังสุตตวะตุสิตาเทวาสัตธรรมนุสสาเวสุงตุสิตานังเทวานังสัตตังสุตตวะนิมมานรติเทวาสัตธรรมนุสสาเวสุงนิมมานรตินังเทวานังสัตตังสุตตวะปรนิมมิตวะสวัสดิเทวาสัตธรรมนุสสาเวสุงปรนิมมิตวะสวัสดินังเทวานังสัตตังสุตตวะพระมกายิกาเทวาสัตธรรมนุสสาเวสุงเอตามบคาวตาภารานาสียังอิสิปตเนมิกาทายเยอนุตรังธรรมจักกังปวัติตังอาปฏิวัติยังสมเนนวาพรมเนนวาเทเวนวามาเรนวาพรมมุนาวาเกนจิวาโลกัสมิอิติหเตนะคะเนนะเตนะมุหเตนะยาวะพรหมโลกาสัตโตอาภุคาจิอายันจัตตสัสหัสสีโลกาธาตุสัมกัมปิสัมปะกัมปิสัมปะเวทิอาปมานุจโอลาโลโอภาโสโลเกปะตุลาหัวสิอาติกรรมเมวเทวานังเทวานุภาวังอัตโคภะคะวะอุทานังอุทานเนสิอัญญาสิวัตโคโกนทันโยอัญญาสิวัตโคโกนทันโยดิหิดิหิทังอายะสมโตโกนทันยาสะอัญญาโกนทันโยตเววนามังอาโหสิติว้าว this is wonderful please try to understand the meanings of this discourse in English this is the Buddha teachings in short now here is the most venerable Dr. Bhikkhu Bodhi To give his highly praised sermons and introductions to Buddhism, Part Six. Okay, so now we come to the sixth, and this will be the last class in this introduction to Buddhism series. So this class I entitled it "With the Buddha's Teachings and Today's World," or something like "The Relevance of the Buddha's Teachings to Today's World." And there's first a, com a common misunderstanding of Buddhism that it's necessary to straighten out. And sometimes one gets the impression, if one reads just an anthology of Buddhist texts or a sampling of Buddhist discourses, you see again and again that the discourses are addressed: "Oh monks, oh monks, oh monks! Here a monk does this, there a monk does that," and you get the impression that Buddhism is entirely a teaching intended for monks, for monastics. But you see, the Buddha made the 
primary aim, sort of the distinctive, the unique aim of his teaching is enlightenment and liberation. Liberation from samsara, that is the round of repeated birth and death to which ordinary beings are bound by their greed, hatred, and delusion. And so what the Buddha's distinctive discovery was that path, that path of training, the Noble Eightfold Path, that leads to the elimination of greed, hatred, and delusion, and thereby brings liberation from the cycle of birth and death. And to follow that path in its fullness requires, for the most part, a life of renunciation. The Buddha himself, when he was still living in the palace as a aristocrat, when he realized that he wanted to seek liberation, he left the life of the palace, the life of luxury, and went into the forest, put on the saffron robes of an ascetic, and then for six years he practiced different types of meditation, different types of austerity, in order to reach the final goal of enlightenment. And once he attained the goal, in order to make that path available to others in its fullness, in its completeness, he established a monastic order. In fact, it wasn't so much that the Buddha said, I'm going to establish a monastic order, but just once he started teaching, those who listened to his teaching, at least some of them, and decided that they wanted to pursue the ultimate goal full time, then made the determination to also follow the Buddha into the homeless life. And so they would come to the Buddha and say, please, Venerable, let me go forth into the homeless life under you. And in this way, the Buddha, without the original design of establishing a monastic order, would admit them, take them on as his renunciant disciples. And so in this way, by stages, a monastic order um, grew and came into being. And through the centuries, that monastic order from some 500 BC, it's existed right up to the present. It's out <laughs> I'm often proud to say that it's outlasted the Roman Empire, the Persian Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, <laughs> the so many dynasties of Chinese kings and emperors. It's outlasted, what else? <laughs> and it still exists today. Okay, so from the fact that the Buddha established a monastic order, and often he spoke the discourses to the making sort of the monks and the nuns the primary audience of his discourses, one might get the impression that the Buddha, Buddha's teaching is essentially a monastic teaching. But I think this would be a misunderstanding. And the way I came to sort of look at the Buddha's teaching following a traditional formulation, is to say that it is formulated for the purpose of promoting three kinds of benefits. So this is a scheme of, uh, or a set of categories that comes down in the classical texts. So when we look at any teaching of the Buddha, we ask, what is that teaching intended to achieve? What is the underlying motivation behind that teaching? What is its purpose? And when we bring up that question, what we could say is that the teachings are intended to promote three kinds of benefits. So one of these I call, or it's called, the benefit in this present life. In Pali it's dita dhamma, atta or hita. And that means the good that can be realized right here and now. And that is, includes personal well-being, inner happiness, wholeness, um, a state of inner mental health, as well as social well-being, promoting harmony between people, promoting peaceful relations between people, 
promoting just relations between people and within societies and communities. So this is one kind of, you call it a very tangible, concrete, immediately visible benefit that comes from the Buddha's teaching. So even if one puts aside, I would say, any kind of belief in existence beyond this life and just says, okay, we're, we live this one life here and now, how can we be happy in this life? How can we promote our own well-being and the well-being of our community, family, society? We find many teachings of the Buddha relevant to that goal. And they're always very sensible, very, I say, reasonable teachings. That there's nothing that really requires blind faith in any kind of, of principle or appealing to any kind of divine being, please help me, please benefit me or my family. But there are principles that we could actually adopt and put into practice for ourselves and in our relations with others. And we see that they lead to this personal and social well-being and happiness. I'm going to come to some of them as we go along. Okay, the second benefit is what the text call Samparahika Hita, which means the benefit pertaining to future lives, to the next life and lives beyond that. And so the Buddha didn't teach only for those who are seeking immediate liberation from the cycle of birth and death. Because most of us, almost all of us, <laughs> are going to have a future life. We're going to go on from this life to future lives. And so we have to understand what are the principles, the underlying system of laws that govern this process of rebirth. And the basic principles, the system of laws that govern the process, it's entirely an ethical system. So ethics, according to Buddhism, is not something purely subjective, purely created by human beings but there's a kind of objective moral order that we have to be able to discern, to discover. And one of the accomplishments of the Buddha is to discover that moral order and to teach that order to others. And so the basic principle that underlies this benefit pertaining to future lives is that by behaving ethically, by following codes like the five precepts, which we'll come to, the ten ways of wholesome action, which I took in the class on karma, then one will be creating the conditions, cultivating the causes that lead to a favorable, to a fortunate rebirth in the future. So we want to avoid, we call, an undesirable rebirth that is a fall into the states of misery and extreme suffering. And we want to secure a happy or fortunate future existence. Existence either as a human being or in one or another of the celestial realms, which are really realms of a superior existence. And so the way to achieve a favorable rebirth is by adopting and molding one's life around these basic ethical principles. And so this is not something that requires a life of renunciation, though of course a life of renunciation adopts those principles as a sort of guiding framework. But in one's day-to-day -day life, one could observe the five precepts, the ten ways of wholesome action, the practice of generosity, compassion for others, and then you could even put in question, I don't know whether there's a life beyond the present one, but if, one is, if there is a life beyond the present one, those will be the conditions, the causes that lead to a good rebirth and then to happiness in future lives. Okay, and then the Buddha teaches that all existence within this round of rebirths, whether it's life in the human realm, 
life in the heavenly realms, not to speak of life in the lower realms, all is subject to eventually to old age and to death. And so therefore, the ultimate aim for Buddhism is to break free from the cycle of birth and death and to attain that state that we call the deathless, the unconditioned, the unborn, in which there's no, no more birth, old age, sickness and death. That is Nibbana. So that's the final and ultimate goal. Okay, and so the attainment of that ultimate goal, that is, that requires the cultivation of those practices like the Noble Eightfold Path in its fullness, the seven factors of enlightenment. And so those are the practices that the Buddha taught principally for the monks, for monks and nuns, but they're not in any way sort of sealed off with a label on them for monastics only, lay people do not touch, but anybody can learn these teachings and put them into practice in their daily life. For example, in the Noble Eightfold Path, sort of the crown of the Noble Eightfold Path is the practice of right mindfulness, the seventh factor, based upon the previous factors. And so when you take up in your day-to-day -day life, if you take up, set aside periods for practicing mindfulness of breathing, observation of the feelings, observation of states of mind, then you're practicing right mindfulness. You're practicing that key element in the Noble Eightfold Path, which is also the practice that we monastics take up. So, whether it's lay people or those who have left the household life, the path to liberation is the same. It's just that monastics, <laughs> we have sort of the benefit of time to devote ourselves more time to the cultivation of the path. Okay, so this is the threefold benefit of the Dhamma. And so it's of benefit no matter what benefit one aims for, if you take up the practice, because the Dhamma, it's structured around this principle of causes and results, seeds and fruits. So you want a particular benefit, so you find what are the causes that lead to that benefit. You have the aim, the determination, the aspiration, then you cultivate the causes. And when the causes are cultivated, and reach maturity, they'll bring that kind of benefit. Okay, then we see that, again, if we look in the Buddha's discourses, that they're directed towards the achievement both of one's own good and the good of others. Yeah, so here, the Buddha speaks about four kinds of people. So one who is living and practicing neither for his own welfare, nor for the welfare of others. One is, who is practicing for the welfare of others, but not for his own welfare. One who is practicing for his own welfare, but not for the welfare of others. And one who is practicing both for his own welfare and for the welfare of others. And then of these four, the one that the Buddha praises the most and sort of sets up as the model is the one who is practicing both for his own welfare and for the welfare of others. And then he illustrates this with the simile that it's like when you, from the cow comes milk, then from the milk one gets something called curd, it's a delicacy in India and Sri Lanka, then from the curd comes milk, I'm sorry, from the curd comes butter, then from the butter comes ghee, do you know what ghee is? <laughs> and then from ghee comes something called cream of ghee. It's sort of like the most refined type of ghee. And then that cream of ghee is considered the foremost of all of the products that are derived from the milk of a cow. And so the Buddha says in the same way, the person practicing both for his own welfare 
and for the welfare of others is the foremost, the best, the preeminent, the supreme and the finest of those four persons. Okay, and then what does it mean to practice for the welfare of oneself and for others? Of course, at one level you could say that there's a way of benefiting oneself and others materially by ensuring that you yourself have enough of the basic material requisites to live comfortably and happily, a secure dwelling place, food, clothing, um, medical care, access to medical care. In this culture, a vehicle to travel and other things that one needs and that one provides for oneself and helps others in one's family obtain. But the Buddha, though he mentions the material benefits, what he lays emphasis on as a spiritual teacher is cultivating the spiritual benefits. And so he formulates and explains how one is practicing for the welfare of oneself and for others, first in one text with reference to eliminating and removing greed, hatred, and delusion. So the person practices to remove his own lust, hatred, and delusion, and then encourages and instructs others to remove lust, hatred, and delusion. So that's, we could say, that's the highest way of, pra of promoting one's own well-being and the well-being of others. Of course, the complete removal of greed, hatred, and delusion. That is the attainment of Nibbana itself. But then there's a more basic way of promoting the well-being of oneself and others. And that is through the observance of the five training rules, also called the five precepts. So here we have the text explaining how is a person practicing for his own welfare and the welfare of others. Okay, so a person abstains himself from the destruction of life, from killing, and encourages others to abstain from killing. He abstains from taking what is not given or stealing, from sexual misconduct, adultery, abuse of minors, seduction, and so on from deliberate false speech, and from the use of intoxicants. So one observes those five training principles oneself, and then one encourages and instructs others to observe them. So in that way, one is practicing for one's own well-being by observing them oneself and promoting the well-being of others by teaching others to observe them. And then there's a little text where the Buddha, a monk comes to the Buddha and asks, in what way is a person one of great wisdom? And then the Buddha says, a person of great wisdom doesn't aim at his own harm or at the harm of others or the harm of both, but rather he aims at promoting the well, his own well-being, the well-being of others, the well-being of both, and the welfare of the whole world. So that is a person of great wisdom. Okay, so now I'm laying out something of what we call the framework of Buddha's social thought. And in a way you could say that Buddha's social thought and guides the social conduct are an extension of the personal training. So when we ask, like, what are the obstacles to social well-being? What is it that causes conflict, violence, destruction in any kind of, of society? What is, lies behind all of the different kinds of conflicts and tensions that we find in society? When we really look deeply into it, you could say it's this law, this policy, this regulation, but what lies behind all of this harm are decisions made by human beings. Decisions that are, might be formulated in terms of policies, adopted as laws, promoted by
as dictates by dictators, imposed on a population by tyrants, but what underlies all of the harm facing a society are the intentions of human beings, the motivations of human beings, the mindset of human beings. And so to promote a healthy, happy, harmonious, and just society, one has to look into the minds of human beings and transform the ways of thinking of people to change their attitudes, to change their motivations. And so for this reason, we say that the obstacles to social well-being is the prominence of greed, hatred, and delusion as motivations for action. And this greed, hatred, and delusion at the personal level are said to be the roots of suffering. But when we have whole masses of people whose thinking and attitudes and actions are driven by greed, hatred, and delusion, and we put these all together, then we have very powerful destructive force with forces with destructive impacts on society. And so if we're going to improve the conditions of society, one has to start changing the attitudes of human beings. And that means promoting the removal of greed, hatred, and delusion, and replacing them with their positive counterparts, promoting a culture of, instead of a culture of consumption and competition, promoting a culture of generosity and mutual care, mutual concern. Instead of hatred and violence and discrimination of one group and against another, promoting a culture of loving kindness and compassion and justice and partiality. And instead of allowing a culture of delusion to propagate through, I have to say, through the modern mass media, even including things like Facebook and Twitter, with a lot of misinformation, disinformation, conspir conspiracy theories, prejudices and biases just multiplying um, exponentially to promote a culture of wisdom, even if not the highest wisdom, but clear understanding, reasonable thought, examination to find what is true, what is false, and to be able to distinguish and discriminate the true from the false, instead of grasping upon any kind of rumors that are being spread around and then spreading those rumors to others leading to you know, intense violence against certain groups. Okay, so the obstacles to social well-being, greed, hatred, and delusion have to be weakened and the factors of goodness, the good roots, have to be cultivated and developed and what struck me, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself because this I come towards the end <laughs> of this presentation, but what really would be the channel for promoting a healthy culture would be the educational system. Like we teach people or children reading, write, what is it, reading, writing, arithmetic, but why not have co uh, courses and programs in non-religious ethics, you know, not presenting ethics from the standpoint of any one particular religion, but having them read widely in the best of Christian ethics, Jewish ethics, Buddhist ethics, Hindu ethics, Islamic ethics, the ethics of Plato, Aristotle, some of the great, well, have, for children it would have to be reformulated in simple terms, but then once they get into high school, probably they could read some of these writings in the original. And this would condition the minds of children to understand what is good, what is bad, and to see the great degree of convergence and agreement between many of these different religious and spiritual traditions. Uh, I should also mention, very, very important, the Confucian ethics, which are very, very beautiful. 
very much in agreement with the Buddha's teachings. So to promote well-being in society, we have the five precepts that I already referred to. And this is an interesting sutta, which shows how the Buddha derives the five precepts from moral reflection. This is in the Sanyutta Nikaya. So he, the Buddha is speaking to a group of householders who have come to see him. And they ask him, they say to him, we're not monks, we can't practice these intensive meditations. So give us a teaching that's applicable to ourselves. And then the Buddha gives this very simple but very clear ethical teaching. So the disciple reflects that I want to live, I don't want to die, I want happiness, I'm averse to suffering. And so if somebody were to take my life or to threaten to take my life, that would not be pleasing to me and so if I were to take the life of another person, one who wants to live, who doesn't want to die, that would not be pleasing to that person. And so having reflected thus, he himself abstains from the destruction of life. He instructs others to abstain from the destruction of life and he speaks in praise of abstaining from the destruction of life. And so in that way, the Buddha says that his bodily conduct is purified in three respects. Observing, and then out of this same kind of reasoning, he derives the precepts against stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and so forth. Okay, so there's three respects. One observes the precept oneself, one encourages others to observe it, and then one praises the observance of that precept. And so this is a way of sort of amplifying the effect, the impact of one's own ethical conduct by praising the observance of ethical conduct to others. And there's another sutta that I, or discourse that I didn't include here, in which the Buddha says that one who observes the precept of abstaining from taking life gives safety and security to countless living beings. Because when you take that precept, I will, uh, will not destroy life, I will not kill, then any other living being can feel safe in one's presence. Even, you know, when mosquitoes come into the room or flies, you know, we don't kill them. <laughs> and we're still alive, we, they haven't taken our lives. <laughs> if there's an annoying fly, sometimes we set aside like a cup as a fly catcher. Instead of using the fly swatter to swat it and kill the fly, we just take the cup when the fly is on the wall, catch it, slip some paper underneath the cardboard, and then take it outside, let it go. Then it's happy, it's living, and we're happy because we didn't destroy its life. Okay, so we have this aspect of moral behavior with the five precepts. And then the other kind of ethical practice that goes along with the precepts is generosity. So Buddhism encourages, instead of you know, this consumerist attitude, this attitude of miserliness, of especially in this culture, in this society now, where we have people who are multi-millionaires and billionaires, just promoting policies to keep on building up their wealth so you're not satisfied with two billion, you have to get two billion, five hundred million, then going from 2.5 billion to four billion to six billion, up and up and up, never really satisfied, and just keeping it for themselves. The Buddha encourages sort of the basic practice is generosity to share what one has with others. So he describes the disciple who's living at home, the householder, as one who has a mind free from the stain of miserliness or selfishness, who's generous, open-handed, who delights in giving, who's devoted to charity, and who shares 
his resources with others. And what one finds when one lives a life of moral behavior and practice of generosity, that it brings delight to the mind, enjoyment or joy. And one can reflect on one's moral behavior, reflect on one's generosity, and it gives rise to great joy and happiness. Because the mind is now sort of breaking down the barriers that separate us from others, that sort of lock us in and isolate us from others. And so it is now building upon a kind of web, you know, because we all live in this web of interconnectedness, interrelatedness, which gets obscured by this egotistic clinging to me and mine. So when one observes moral behavior, one shows concern for the lives and property of others, concern for truth. And when one is practicing generosity, one is sharing with others, building that upon that network of connections. Okay, then as part of the training of the mind to remove greed, hatred, and delusion, we have the practice of right effort and right mindfulness. So this is the core of a Buddhist meditation practice. And it might seem, you know, if we look at it superficially, as something that one is just doing within oneself. Like we say that this is my spiritual practice, my inner cultivation. But this inner cultivation has important implications or ramifications for our relations with others, for the way we participate in our societies. Because as we're practicing right mindfulness, the aim is to, at least part of the aim, is to transform our ways of thinking, to transform our attitudes. So when there arise things like greed, anger, selfishness, jealousy, envy, miserliness, we're seeing them, understanding them, and then transforming them transforming them into jet the attitude of generosity, loving kindness, developing the wholesome qualities. And so even this personal, individual meditation practice has broader social implications. And one set of practices that the Buddha taught, meditation practices, which very directly touch on social relationships it's a set which is called the four, sometimes it's called the four divine abodes. The Pali expression is Brahma Vihara, sometimes called the four immeasurables. These are, we have them here, loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, and equanimity or impartiality. So loving kindness means the wish to promote the well-being and happiness of others. And so this is actually cultivated as a meditation. And we're going to be doing this during the meditation session this afternoon. So deliberately cultivating thoughts of loving kindness. And through cultivation, they become stronger and stronger forces within the mind. So over time, gradually, somebody who can have a mind given to a lot of aversion towards others, anger, easily gets, bears ill will towards others. When one cultivates loving kindness, over time, gradually, that ill will and resentment fall away, and one develops this very beautiful wish that others, even the people hostile to yourself, that they would be well and happy. Then compassion, is the wish, it's the, first it's the quality that makes the heart shake with the suffering of others. And compassion then becomes expressed as the wish that those who are afflicted with suffering be free from suffering. Then altruistic joy, this is rejoicing in the good fortune of others, rejoicing in the good qualities of others. And then what's called equanimity here is maybe in this context better impartiality. So looking at everybody equally as equal, 
without discriminations of favoritism, those I like, those I dislike, but seeing everyone as being essentially the same as oneself. Okay, so these are attitudes, again, that are cultivated through meditation, but through persistent practice, they change, they bring about the change within oneself, and in that way, they change the way one acts within one's community and society. And one of the sort of concrete ways in which the Buddha brought this practice of loving-kindness into actual brought this development of meditative development of loving-kindness into actual communal embodiment is a set called the Six Principles of Cordiality, which he taught to the monastic order. Because even though monks have left the worldly life, the household life, but even in a monastic community, little secret, there can be hostilities, <laughs> there can be conflicts, there can be, call this, faction, factions forming, this group against that group. And so to counter that, the Buddha taught these six principles of cordiality. So one is maintaining bodily acts of loving kindness towards one's fellow monks. That is, acting to, acting to them with loving kindness through one's actions, like helping if they get sick, bringing them things they need. The junior monks will sweep the living quarters of the elder monks. If a monk is, has trouble putting on his shoes, the younger monk will put on his shoes and help him take them off. So those are kinds of bodily acts of loving kindness. Then there's verbal acts of loving kindness, speaking gently, politely, respectfully to others, mental acts of loving-kindness, that is, um, thinking thoughts, loving thoughts towards them, and cultivating loving thoughts, and then sharing whatever gains one makes, like on, especially on alms round, when the monks go on alms round, one monk will get a lot, another monk going to a different place might get a little, so when they come back to the dining hall, then they'll share whatever they've obtained, so everybody gets enough food. Um, then observing the same code of precepts, and then preserving and you know, upholding the same, what the Buddha calls that view that's noble and emancipating, that leads to the complete destruction of suffering. So these principles, are they're originally taught for the monastic order, but we could see that we could apply them, at least with certain adaptations, in our relations with other people, in our family, community. And that will bring about real positive changes. Okay, then what I found, one thing I found to be quite a remarkable feature of the Buddha's teachings, and this impressed me at a very early time, even before I became a monk, when I was just reading the Buddha's teachings on my own, I discovered that, you know, we could, what initially attracted me to Buddhism were these very deep, you know, philosophical teachings and high meditative practices, which I wasn't able to practice, but they were still very impressive, these elevated states of consciousness. But what I discovered is that within the discourse collection, there's remarkable number of discourses by the Buddha given to people living family lives and, and lives in their community, showing how they can live together happily and harmoniously. Very, very beautiful teachings that the Buddha gives to husband on how to treat his wife, to the wife how to treat her husband, to parents how to bring up children, to children, how to look after their parents, and the relationships between friends, between teacher and the students, student and teacher, employer and employees, employees to the employer, and so forth. I think I included those, one of those discourses, which sums up everything. 
Yeah, I included this here. It's a sutta or discourse the Buddha gave to a young man whose name was Sigalika. See, one time the Buddha was walking on alms round and when he came to the village, outside the village, there was a young man who he saw he was bowing down to each of the six directions, bowing to the east, east, north, west, south, then bowing down to the underworld and bowing up to the sky. Then the Buddha asked him, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said, well, my father recently passed away and before he passed away he told me that I should pay homage to the six directions. So I'm honoring the last request of my father. And then the Buddha said, well, what you're doing, you're practicing worship of the six directions in one way, but that's not the way I teach worshiping the six directions. And then the Buddha sort of turned the teaching around by explaining the six directions as the relationship between parents and children, husbands and wives, friends and friends, teachers and students, employers and employees, and between the religious and the laity. So I included that there. I'm not going to go into this in detail here. But if you look at that at your own leisure, you'll see that even though some of the principles, of course, are not so relevant today, like that the parents should arrange a suitable marriage <laughs> for their children. <laughs> but most of them, you know, if we put a few of those aside, look almost as though they could have been written in the 21st century. Okay, then I have some teachings that are related to the, to the proper role of the government. And even this the Buddha taught, though of course the Buddha framed it against the monarchical system of government, which had risen to dominance during his own time. But what the Buddha tried to do was to set up an ideal of moral leadership for the king. So kings, as the Buddha saw, saw it, or the kingship, as the Buddha saw it, did not entitle the king just to the arbitrary exercise of power just to try to impose his own power on others, to enrich himself and his family, to punish arbitrarily those he doesn't like, to kick out those of his ministers he doesn't like, to send out angry tweets early in the morning. <laughs> He sees that kingship is, entails the responsibility that the king, the proper ruler, is responsible for promoting the well-being of everybody within his realm. So this is a sutta. It's, yeah, so in the sutta, there's the elder king who's about to retire to give up the throne to his son, the young prince. And so the young prince asks his father, what is the duty of a righteous monarch? And then his father replies that the king, the righteous monarch, should rely on the Dhamma. And here the Dhamma doesn't mean the Buddha's teaching as such, but it means this principle of righteousness and truth that lies behind the Buddha's teaching. So relying on the Dhamma, you should provide lawful protection, shelter, and safety for your own dependents, for the Brahmins and householders, for the people living in the towns and the countryside, for ascetics and Brahmins, even for the beasts and birds. Let no crime prevail in your kingdom, and to those who are in need, give wealth. That's very important, that it's the responsibility of the government to ensure that there's no poverty in the country. If we apply this today, we should say that the government has a responsibility to ensure 
that everybody has a satisfactory standard of living. Okay, and then whatever ascetics and Brahmins there are living in your kingdom, from time to time you should approach them and ask what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what is blameworthy, what is blameless, what is to be followed, what is not to be followed, and then you should listen to them and you, then you should avoid what is unwholesome and do what is wholesome. So that's the duty of a righteous monarch. So now we don't have, of course, we don't have a monarchical system of government, but we could take these same principles and say that is the responsibility of a government today to ensure that everybody can live in safety and security, that there's no poverty in the realm, and that everybody is able to to live a, have a satisfactory standard of living, peace, and to live a peaceful way of life. And so, if we look at some of the problems, I just touch on this very briefly that, that we face in the world today. We have I've tried to sort of sum them up just with four, you could multiply them, but for convenience just take four. Persistent wars and militarism, glaring economic inequality and poverty, racial, ethnic, gender, religious violence and discrimination. All of those you could see, if we take the principles that we've just gone through and apply them, we could see that they provide a solution to these problems. Even something like climate change and its impact and the changing environment, forest, wildfires, floods, storms, droughts, and so on. If we understand and apply the principle of cause and effect, we could see the underlying, with wisdom, the underlying causation, and then we see what we have to do to reduce this problem and ensure that future generations can live safely. Okay, so maybe this you'll do for some of the study or examination of how the Buddha's teaching applies to our world today. This is amazing. Thank you, Dr. Bhikkhu Bodhi, for the rational introduction to Buddhism. I learned a lot from your beautiful presentation. Now, let's listen to the most venerable Savati Dhammika Mahatero on my spiritual journey. This is a part four. As it happened, we had arrived in Bangkok right at the middle of that, I think it was October 1973 revolution where the military government was overthrown. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but we arrived pretty much right in the middle of a complete chaos. <laughs> I can remember seeing the um, National Lottery office being burnt down because the students believed that the money was being misappropriated and things like that. But that's another thing. After this trouble was over, the government, the military dictators uh, fled the country and um, things went back to, things went back to abnormal. <laughs> so then he took me around to various temples. Um, I stayed a night in Wat Arun and some other temples. And I remember one experience I had there where he took me to a, uh, a temple whose abbot was his friend. And we, we went in and the, there were young monks sitting around a round table, their, their, their dana had just been delivered. And they must have been freshly shaved. Their heads were shaved, their eyebrows were shaved, and they had these bright orange robes. And I thought they just looked absolutely beautiful. It was the image of the perfect monk. Serene, smiling, friendly faces, and etc. And of course in Thailand when you approach monks you sort of have to crawl on the floor. Anyway, we went in sort of crawling on our elbows and that, and my friend said, shut the door. And so I crawled back and closed the door, and when I closed the door, 
pinned to the back of the door was a Playboy pin-up, a centerfold from a <laughs> Playboy magazine. Well, that was a bit of an eye-opener, I have to tell you. <laughs> So I was seeing, I was, in a sense, I was being introduced to uh, a sort of two worlds. There was the Buddhism of the image and the Buddhism of the reality, at least the reality somewhere. Anyway, I, I won't go into the details, but over the next month, maybe it was, a, maybe it was more than a month, I went, I went to Chiang Mai, we went to Sukhothai, and I was really taken by Thai culture. The beautiful, very uh, aesthetic way they present the food and the beauty of the temples, and, and some of them really are beautiful. And some, I remember going to the National Museum and just being really quite overawed by the, the aesthetic quality of the art and the culture, and particularly the, particularly the Buddhist stuff. And then I decided uh, I'd better have a look at Laos. So I had quite a lot of adventures there because I crossed the border without a visa. We went across the Mekong River. And um, eventually I got a visa, but uh, then I went through Laos. Uh, we went to Champaka um, and uh, Lung Prabang, and once again, it, it, this Buddhist culture quite fascinated me, but I become increasingly starting to feel that while all this fascinated me and was new and, and interesting, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a monk there. So when my time was up there, I decided to go to Burma. So I went to Burma, and... Um, it was so different in those days. There were very few cars, there was no sort of modern advertising and all that sort of thing. It was a very sleepy, quiet, uh, fading city. And um, virtually immediately I met people who were Buddhists. And when I told them that I had wanted to become, a, I was a Buddhist and that I wanted to become a monk, almost immediately people were so helpful. And without going through all the details, I was eventually taken to one of the main temples there where they had the Fifth Council. And there I was introduced to a monk called Upanyadipa. And uh, he taught me some meditation. Um, and uh, this is what I wanted. I, I knew that meditation was an integral part of Buddhism, but I had no idea how to do it. I had tried to do it myself, but without somebody guiding you, it's somewhat difficult. So um, then I went around and had a look at various things in Burma, which once again just fascinated me. I can remember very vividly, almost as if it was yesterday, my experience at the great Shwedagong Pagoda. And I'm 71 now. <clears throat> I have seen some of the great monuments in the world, the Palace of Versailles, the Forbidden City in China. I've seen all of these things, but nothing compares to that stupa. It is the most beautiful thing ever built by mankind, I think. And it's a fitting tribute to the Enlightened One. It is so beautiful. So the, one of these people I'd met took me there. And I remember going there in the evening when it was cool and listening to the chanting and the smell of the flowers that people were offering and the, how, how elegant and, and uh, uh, people were dressed and the, the general peacefulness and that. It, it absolutely absorbed me. And most of all is listening to the tinkle of the bells on the top of the of the pagoda. It was just enchanting. However, in those days, foreigners were only allowed to stay for, for seven days. So I had to leave. But I wanted more. So I went back to Bangkok, 
I got another visa for Burma, and I had arranged with Venerable uh, Upanyadipa to do a meditation course. So I arrived back and went straight to the uh, Kabaye Pagoda, that's the name of the place, and I did a seven-day meditation course under the guidance of uh, this teacher with about 25 other people. So that was my introduction to meditation. And for the next several years, I learned that, I did that technique. Then after seven days, I went straight to the airport and back to Bangkok, and I got another visa. And this time, I went to um, Mandalay and um, Bagan and several other places. And then when I had got that visa for the third time, the Burmese embassy said, we're not going to give you another one, three's enough. <laughs> so I didn't want to stay in, I couldn't stay in Laos because it was clear that the communists were going to tape over fairly soon. And I didn't really want to become a monk in Thailand. So I thought, well, the next thing is to go to India and try there. So after my seven days in Burma, I flew to... Um, Buddha Dharma TV is doing its best to educate the Dharma lovers with the noble teachings of Buddhas. We therefore present to you a couple of the preachers to talk on the noble Dharma. We appeal to you to take the try to advantage of these programs and understand the true natures of yourself, the world, the universe, and the like. Here is the Venerable Punadamo Mahatero to talk about the early Buddhist history. Namo Tassa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bagawato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa So the, the Buddhist teaching, uh, the Dhamma, one of the characteristics of that is that it is uh, akaliko, which means timeless outside of time or beyond time. And this is a word that has more than one level of meaning. But one of the meanings is that the teaching is useful and good and true in any period of time, whether it's ancient India or uh, the modern day and anything in between. It's not something that is specific, specifically true only for one historical context. So this, this we can bear in mind, but it's also, there's also another aspect to the Buddhist teaching in that it was given in a specific context, in a specific geographical, cultural, historical moment. And it's uh, useful for us to understanding the Buddhist teaching to be able to see it as it were through ancient Indian eyes and to put ourselves in the space of his contemporary uh, students and, and audience. This can be difficult for us. We live in a quite different time and place. And some of the misunderstandings that uh, arise about the Buddhist teaching, I think, comes from the tendency of moderns to anachronistically put their ideas and values and assumptions back into the ancient context. So they miss some of the nuances of the teaching. You can find in the suttas, when you read a, a sutta, that very often, particularly in the Digga and Majima, you'll see very often that there'll be a framing paragraph at the beginning, 
telling us who the Buddhist audience was, whether it was lay people or monks, and whether it was a large crowd or a small group, and what city it was in, or so forth. And this can often help us to understand the, the teaching, the specific teaching, because the Buddha did pitch his discourses to the specific audience very skillfully. So in this uh, talk, I would like to explore a little bit of the background of India at the Buddhist time, so we can begin to fit the Buddhist teaching into that picture. India has always been, from the beginning even down to the present day, it's been a very diverse cultural area with many ethnic groups, many languages, uh, many religions. And this was true in the 5th century BC, and it's true in the 21st century AD. If we go back to the Buddhist time, and let's first of all specify what that is. Traditionally, the Buddhist calendar is dated from the Parinibbana, or the passing away of the Buddha, at 543 BC as year one. But modern scholarship has determined that that date is uh, at least 80 years too early. And the Buddha probably actually died sometime around 400 BC, which would put his birth at about 480. So he lived for those 80 years, roughly the 5th century BC. And the India of his time was a dynamic mix of influences. If we go back prior to the Buddha, we can see at least three roots that went into the shaping of the culture of northern India. Roughly the Ganges Valley is the area we're concerned with. The three roots would be the Harappan culture, the indigenous Dravidians of the Ganges, and the incoming Aryan tribes. Around um, 3000 BC, on, onwards for the next thousand years or so, there was a very urbanized and in some ways quite advanced civilization in the northwest of the area we're concerned with in the Indus Valley region that's called by modern uh, archaeologists the Harappan culture after one of the great sites. These people had an agricultural civilization. The Indus Valley at that time was much more fertile and productive than it became later. It was so, has somewhat dried out since then but at the time it was very rich, rich enough to provide enough agricultural surplus to support large cities. And these, we don't know a lot about these people and their culture because no one has been able to decipher their writing. But they did live in large, very well-organized cities that were laid out in quite uh, rigid grid patterns which indicates a high degree of central planning. They didn't grow up haphazardly. And they had, much earlier than anyone else, they had water systems to have running water and sewerage in the homes. And they seem to have been, from the archaeological evidence, they seem to have been a fairly egalitarian culture. There's not a great deal of difference in size between the largest and the smallest dwellings. So that would indicate a quite flat social hierarchy. And they were in decline for some time. We think that it may have been ecological collapse, which happened to many early cultures, that they overtaxed their 
environmental base and they probably over farmed and were no longer able to support them their high population and the cities began to decline and at that time beginning uh, roughly around 1500 BC the uh, second big uh, influence on India came in which were the Aryans they were tribes of people from somewhere in Central Asia or probably around the um, Caspian Sea area uh, perhaps in modern Pakistan. Uh, we don't really know for sure where they originated. One of their branches, the Iranian branch, in their uh, Zoroastrian scriptures, they recount the movement of the Aryans from the far north. And they were, according to these scriptures, they were impelled to move by climate change, by the climate getting a lot colder, and this forced them south. In any case, they had early developed some technologies that gave them a significant military advantage over everybody else at the time, uh, namely uh, early domestication of the horse and the use of metal weapons, first bronze and then later iron. And using these advantages, they spread quite widely over Eurasia into Europe and uh, south into uh, Iran and India. All the languages that uh, we call Indo-European spring from this root. So that's most of the European languages as well as Iranian and many of the Indian languages like Hindi and Bengali. The group that penetrated into India first overran what was left of the Harappan culture, which was already in decline. And at that time, these uh, Aryans were at a cultural level that was quite um, barbaric, roughly the equivalent of like, the Homeric age in Greece, the heroic age. Heroic meaning that they were very warlike and um, they would fight amongst themselves as well as against the uh, preceding cultures in India. Culturally, they, they were divided already as they first appeared in India. They were already divided into three uh, castes or Varna, the warrior caste, the priestly caste, and the cattle herders and their economy was like many nomadic peoples was dependent on uh, domestic animals they had horses and cattle that was their source of wealth and of uh, their economy religiously they worshipped a pantheon of gods headed by Indra the um, chief of their gods a sky god and this uh, early uh, pantheon that appears in the Vedas is uh, visible in uh, many other of the descendant cultures from, from that initial Aryan expansion, such as the Greek pantheon, the Norse pantheon, and uh, we have uh, a version of it in Buddhism, in the uh, the gods of Tawatinsa heaven, which seem to be very much modeled on that early Vedic pantheon. The Vedas were their oral scriptures, and they seem to have had those um, scriptures very early on in oral form. And it was the Brahmin caste who maintained the tradition, remembered the scriptures. The Vedas give us our information about the early gods, which are not the same gods that were prominent in later Hinduism. This is something definitely not to get mixed up. Shiva doesn't appear at all in the Vedas. Vishnu is a relatively minor figure. And uh, Brahma 
doesn't really appear under that name either. Indra was the chief god, and probably the second most important god was Agni, the god of fire. And we see that fire worship is a common theme of um, early Aryan religion. It occurs in the Vedas and Zoroastrianism in Iran also has a very strong core of uh, fire ritual. And we see uh, even in, um, in Europe with the Romans and the sacred fires that they would keep burning tended in the home and also in the city by the Vestals. So the sky god and the fire god, they had uh, also a, a pantheon of other gods, and the number of 33 does come up, which is also the number of the gods in Tawatinsa heaven, in the Buddhist uh, iteration. So after they conquered through the um, Indus Valley, they moved on expanding into the Ganges. And here they met a different, uh, a different cultural base, and this is the third, it's actually the oldest uh, Indian um, cultural group. Uh, it's the third that I'm mentioning, is the indigenous Dravidian people of the Ganges Valley. And at the time they were quite primitive they were in a kind of a Neolithic stage of, of civilization. And the Aryans' advance down the Ganges was slow because of the terrain. The whole area was uh, thickly covered in jungle at the time, so it was a slow going for them. And they made much use of fire, which was uh, has been considered... Uh, perhaps one of the reasons Agni, the fire god, was so important in the early days. But they eventually conquered the whole of the, the Ganges Valley. They didn't fully displace the indigenous inhabitants, but they incorporated them into their civilization by adding them as the fourth and lowest caste, the, the Sudas. Uh, the laboring caste, and the Vasas, the, uh, who were the cattle herders, evolved into being the merchant class as the Aryans settled down and settled into uh, an agricultural and uh, urbanized civilization and matured beyond their barbaric phase. Their political arrangement in the, in the early times seems to have been in the form of republics. And when we say republics, we should be very careful not to impose modern ideas of what it means to have a republic. They certainly were not democratic in any way. Um, they were uh, assemblies of the heads of clans so it was more like an aristocratic republic. There was, by the time of the Buddha, when we get to that 5th century before Christ, there was a decided, there had already been a decided movement away from the republican form of government. A few republics still survived. The Buddha himself was born into one in the north of this cultural area, on the actual fringe of it. Uh, the Sakyan Republic, which was probably being out in the backwoods, uh, the boonies of the culture area, was probably quite old-fashioned and still preserved more of the old traditions of the Aryan Republics. But elsewhere in the Ganges Valley, we have the arising of monarchies, kingdoms, and traditionally they were considered to be 16 of them. So they would have been quite small geographically. And like a lot of uh, early kingdoms around the world, the sense of the king ruling was more rule over people than of uh, geography. It was considered that power radiated from the, the center and 
those who were subject to the king, they, they, they were in his area, they paid taxes to the, the central monarchy. The two most powerful monarchies in India at that time were Magadha and Kosala, both of which the Buddha spent extensive amount of time in and became close to the, the kings of those, those kingdoms. The king would rule the Raja, is the, the king, he was considered to be the head of the Kshatriya class, and uh, he would always rule together with a Purohita, a, a Brahmin, the head of the Brahmin caste, as his prime minister or vizier. The title was Purohita, and that was always taken from the Brahmins. So the actual rule was a kind of a dual rulership of the two highest castes, the, the two supreme castes were the warriors and the priests. The rest of society was uh, divided into various um, occupational groups, but we didn't yet have the extreme subdivisions of the caste system as it uh, evolved later in India. It was still very much just the broad categories of warriors, priests, merchants, and laborers. There were also the outcasts who were uh, those who uh, performed occupations that were considered unclean, like uh, leather work or uh, refuse removal. They were the outcasts or chandalas, as they were called in the in the Pali. At the very bottom, they were considered outside of the caste system altogether. So we can see here also with the um, exclusion of the Chandalas, one of the cultural hallmarks of India from right from the Harappan times was a emphasis put on personal and social cleanliness and hygiene. So the only way they could maintain a ritual purity and still get the dirty jobs done was to exclude the people who did those jobs from a respectable society. So it was not definitely not an egalitarian society. It was a hierarchical, very structured society. Everyone had their place and their uh, functions. We can see a example of this in his ideal form in the Sagala Sutta, where the Buddha is talking to a layperson about the best way to conduct one's life in, uh, in society. And uh, he meets this layperson who is doing a ritual worshipping the six directions. And the Buddha tells him, uh, I will teach you how we do the how we worship the six directions in the discipline of the Buddha. And he identifies the six directions with six social relationships. He has this man representing an arbitrary center, and there's a kind of social mandala of relationships. He has those who are above him, those who are beside him, and those who are beneath him. He has relationships with his friends, with his wife and children, with his uh, workmen and servants, with the um, holy men and uh, Brahmins, and so forth. And in each type of relationship, there is a reciprocal exchange of the performance of duties. And this was an important social concept that the harmony of the society was preserved when everybody performs their duties. And the duties are reciprocal, they're symmetrical. They're not identical both ways. The duties of a master to a servant, for example, is to look after them and make sure they have enough to eat, 
and not to overwork them and to give them time off when uh, it's possible to do so. And the duties of the servant is to serve the master well, to perform their, their work skillfully, and so forth. So, and if both parties perform their duties, then there's harmony. And the Buddha presents this as, quote, as an ideal. So there's no exploitation or abuse from either side, but nor is there any assumption of equality or of a person having right, a right to um, the receiving of these uh, things. It's a sense of the other party has the duty to provide them. The um, technological level of India at the time was uh, beginning to enter a new phase. It was, as I said, agricultural civilization. They had rice cultivation and also uh, in, in the western area was more uh, rice and uh, then rather than rice, it was like wheat and barley. So they had, uh, with rice, you require irrigation and you require some organization. And that was, uh, so that was happening. They, they had the uh, cities, urbanized centers. They had uh, metalwork, although iron at the time was still relatively rare and was used more for uh, weaponry rather than for practical purposes. There were two technological advances that were fairly new at, by the time of the Buddha, and they were making a big impact on society. One was money. The use of a currency is something that has a very profound effect on a civilization when it first begins to use it and replaces barter, because it opens up the economy, and it also makes trade more... Uh, lucrative and um, productive, uh, both internal trade and external trade. And there was beginning some contact with and trade with other cultures, such as uh, Mesopotamia and uh, Southeast Asia, which was called Sawanabumi, and also with the Greek world. These were all in a very beginning phase at the time of the Buddha. It seems that um, India did not have a lot of seaborne commerce at the time, but that was the beginning of it. We see in the Jataka stories, there's sometimes stories of merchants going to sea, but you do get the feeling from these stories that it wasn't, uh, it was a very perilous adventure because most of these stories in the Jatakas, the sea voyages end in shipwreck. So there is a hint in uh, at least the one passage in the Diga Nikaya that the Buddha knew of the existence of the Greek civilization because when he's criticizing the Brahmins who held that the caste system was divinely inspired, the Buddha was uh, maintaining it was a human invention. It was just a social convention. It didn't have an ultimate reality. He said, uh, consider the Yonas, meaning the Greeks. Yona is the Indian um, meaning of, uh, or the Indian corruption of the word uh, Ionian. And so they called the Greeks Yonas. He says, consider the Yonas they do not have a caste system like us. They only recognize two classes, free and slave. So uh, the caste system was not uh, primordial. It wasn't laid down by God. It was a uh, human convention for purely practical purposes of dividing people by occupation. So we have mentioned uh, often in the suttas and, and more so in the vinya of uh, various uh, amounts of money 
in Kahapanas and Maha Kahapanas. Uh, this was the, the currency of the time. And this would allow a more sophisticated economy and the development of uh, trading networks. The other technology that was of significant impact, although this really didn't have a big impact at the Buddhist time, it, it was a bit later, was writing, which was probably first beginning in India around this time of the Buddhist life. The Buddha's scriptures were not written down. No scriptures were written down at first. It seems like the first use of writing in India was for purely mundane purposes, such as the merchants keeping accounts or the kings sending um, diplomatic messages back and forth. It was probably even considered uh, profane to commit holy texts to, to writing. They were preserved orally by memorization. And this was actually a very reliable means of transmission and preservation of the scriptures because the method used was chanting in groups. So you would have a large group of monks who would um, learn by heart one of the Nikayas. And this is one of the reasons the Sutta Pitaka is divided into Nikayas, which means something like a, an assembly or a college. There would be a group of monks that learnt the Digha Nikaya by heart, for example, and part of their duties every day was to chant one of the suttas from the Digha all together as a group. And that would be self-correcting, because if anybody made a mistake, all the rest in the group would uh, be able to correct that. So the suttas were preserved in that way for the first several hundred years. Religiously at the Buddha's time, the Brahmanic religion was still the, uh, the predominant or the establishment religion. And we should uh, distinguish this uh, Brahmanism, as it's generally called by modern scholars, from Hinduism. Hinduism, as we know it later, was a later development of the, um, of the various roots of Indian thought. At the time of the Buddha, for example, um, the non-Vedic deities like Shiva were not important, uh, if they were known at all. The Brahmins held the Vedas as their scriptures, and the Vedas were considered very sacred. It was actually a belief that the Vedas predated the universe, that the, the supreme uh, God first created the Vedas, and then he created the universe as a vehicle for the Vedas to be expressed. The practice of the Vedic religion was very uh, ritualistic. The Brahmins would perform sacrifices. And in very early times, there were probably human sacrifices. There are some hints of that, but that didn't exist by the Buddhist time, but there were still animal sacrifices. And they were performed in a very minutely governed ritualistic manner with certain gestures and accoutrements and chanting. And it was a belief that uh, if the the sacrifice was performed exactly correctly, then the gods were compelled to perform their their half of the bargain. So a lay person would um, hire Brahmins to perform a ritual, say for fertility of their field or for the health of their son or you know some some worldly um, desire to be fulfilled. And the Brahmins would have a specific ritual and a specific sacrifice to perform for that. And if the fellow didn't get what he wanted from the gods, that all that meant was the Brahmins had made some mistake in, either in the chanting or the gestures. There, it wasn't perfect and we better try it again.
That was the establishment religion. And the Buddha was very critical of the animal sacrifices and, and always spoke against them you know, for the destruction of living beings. But that wasn't the whole of the religious life of ancient India. One of the, one of the really uh, unique characteristics of Indian civilization uh, was its uh, very broad tolerance of uh, different religions and philosophies. There was no attempt to impose an orthodoxy by force so there were quite a wide range of non-Brahmanical religious groups. And we see in the suttas often the phrase uh, referring to uh, holy men as samanas and brahmins. And the brahmins we've spoken of, the samanas were men, and in some cases women, but mostly men, who would go off into the forest to seek a higher states of consciousness, mostly by what they call tapas, which is self-mortification, various uh, kinds of extreme fasting and, and uh, exposure to extreme heat or uh, holding uncomfortable postures for long periods of time. And the Buddha himself, before he became the Buddha, the Bodhisattva, I went through six years of experimenting with these kind of practices before he gave them up as, as fruitless. But it was a, a widespread movement in, in India. And these people were called samanas. And that's a word that's cognate with the, the word shaman. As we have in many cultures around the world, uh, shamans or a, a specific class of priestly individuals who go into trances or communicate with the spirits or gods. The Samana movement probably originated not with the Aryan newcomers, but with the primordial culture of, of India in the indigenous Dravidian tribes of, of the north. So the religious life of the time was a mixture of these these different early groups that uh, were merging and blending by this time into one civilization. The Buddhist order of monks, the, the Sangha, actually has some characteristics both of Brahmins and of Samanas. The, the uh, bhikkhus are often called Samanas and and uh, the Buddha himself was sometimes referred to as Mahasamana, the great Samana. And we still to this day call a, a novice uh, a Samanera. That's the Pali for a, a novice is little Samana. But with the Vinaya and the discipline of the orderliness of the monks it does have some characteristics of, of the Brahmins. And in Buddhist countries like Sri Lanka and uh, Thailand, the bhikkhus take up some of the role of the Brahmins as a, as a priestly group. And although it was never part of the original uh, intention of the establishment of the Sangha, the, the, the bhikkhus will perform to some degree some, some rituals. Of course, not sacrifices, but chanting of uh, paritas and so on at auspicious occasions. So the Buddha operated in this environment of ancient India. And one of the things we note about the Buddha's career, of his teaching career, is that he was free to move about the whole length and breadth of uh, that culture zone, that, which is called in the, in the Pali text, it's called the middle country, Majima Padesa, uh, which refers to the Ganges Valley in northern India. And uh, he preached to all classes of societies, from the Chandalas, the outcasts, 
all the way up to the, the kings and was respected and um, supported everywhere he went. So this was a very fortunate moment for the Buddha to come into the world, a fortunate time and place, some place that would not only tolerate but honor and revere a, a teacher of a, a new way of life, a new teaching, a new religion or philosophy. We can compare that to the experience of Jesus Christ born into the Roman Empire and his teaching career was cut short after three years and they executed him. That's unthinkable that such a thing would happen in India to a, a holy teacher. The Buddha in his previous life, before he he was born as the, as the, as Siddhartha Gautama, was spent in uh, to see to heaven, and it said that before he came down, and by that time he had completed all the Bharamis, and he was just waiting to take birth and attain Buddhahood in the human realm, and it said before he took birth he examined the conditions, the time and the place for the suitability of the arising of a Buddha. So the arising of the Buddha in this uh, account at that time was not accidental. It was an ideal time for the arising of a Buddha. It was a society that was uh, supportive of the teachings and a society advanced enough to have a a culture and a, a civilization that would be receptive to the teachings. So this is a brief uh, introduction to the uh, the conditions of India at the time of the Buddha. And uh, in subsequent talks, I would like to explore the later developments, the establishment of the sasana and the later developments in the Buddha's teaching. But uh, for this time, I wanted to establish the background and the basis for the time and place of the Buddha. Well, that's all for tonight. I hope you enjoyed the programs. If you have any questions or suggestions, to please write to us at info at buddhadharmatv.com. Thank you. Good night. Namo Buddhaya.